Welcome everybody to this panel on Masters of Surgery on Safe Thyroidectomy. My name is Keith Heller. My co-moderator is Claudio Cernea from Sao Paulo. The other members of the panel are Jeremy Freeman from Toronto, Paolo Micoli from Pisa, Italy, Tom Fahey from New York, and Greg Randolph from Boston. Um, this is really a, a treat for all of us because in addition to being colleagues who've known each other for many years, all of us are actually very close personal friends. So this will be a lot of fun. And I would also point out to you that in addition to their academic reputations, I would guesstimate that the four panelists among them have probably done in the neighborhood of 30,000 thyroidectomies. So you are hearing not just what people have read, but based on their own experience. So each panelist is going to speak for 15 minutes. They will follow each other without further interruptions or introductions. And we will try our best to leave 30 minutes at the end for discussion among the panelists and to answer questions from the audience. So our first speaker will be Jeremy Freeman who will talk about central node dissection. Oh, one last administrative thing, I'm sorry. Just to remind all of you, the president's reception starting at seven o'clock tonight in this room is for everybody who's a registrant at the meeting. It is not just for presidents. <laughs> Can we back up that slide for a minute? Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith for that kind introduction and uh, I thank the uh, organizing committee for doing me the honor of inviting me to this session. I'd like to talk a little bit about central neck dissection, both primary and in the redo situation. How do I change this? Yeah. That's me. I'd like to give um, uh, a kudo to Matthew McGarry, who was my fellow two years ago, who put together this video. He's a cinematographic whiz and you'll see why uh, after we present this. Uh, I have three disclosures as follows. I'd just like to point out to you that we successfully had our second World Congress about a year ago, and the third World Congress is planned uh, four years, actually three years hence, and it will take place in Boston, and uh, hopefully many of you can attend. So, just a few words before the video. This talk hopefully is seven minutes, and Keith, please prompt me when seven minutes are up. And uh, the video is approximately seven minutes as well. So, I needn't tell you that the incidence of thyroid cancer is uh, exponentially growing, and I believe there are 62,000 cases predicted for this year by the American Cancer Society. So, why, why is that important? Well, I did an audit of my personal experience, and over a 24-month period, I did 740 thyroid operations, and the breakdown is as follows. Um, the vast majority of thyroid cancer nowadays is papillary thyroid cancer, probably because of two reasons. Uh, I don't think the incidence is increasing, it's just that we're detecting it more, obviously, and I think ultrasound is probably the culprit and that um, I think pathology is getting a little bit more sophisticated and we're calling, pathologists in fact, are calling thyroid cancer uh, in a, with much more frequency than they used to uh, in years gone by. Why is that important? Because it's papillary carcinoma that metastasizes to lymph nodes in the neck, in addition to the small incidence of medullary and anaplastic carcinoma. Here are the lymph node compartments of the neck, which we're all, we're all familiar with. Just want to point out that classically, the lymph node compartment, the central lymph node compartment, is deemed from the um, uh, anominate to the hyoid. I don't believe that that is actually correct. I deem that to be from the cricoid to the anominate. Often, oftentimes, uh, this is dissected in many centers. I don't believe that that's necessary on a routine basis. The odd time, you'll see a Delphian node in this area, and that can be addressed with a, a local resection. So what about the implication of metastatic nodes? 
Well, uh, years ago, we, I personally had about a 522 uh, case series. In our series, the incidence of occult nodes was about 23%. But in the literature, there's a vast dichotomy uh, of the range of lymph nodes. So why don't we see recurrence in 82% of patients uh, treated without neck dissection? Well, probably one reason might be radioactive iodine, although I'm not sure about that. And the other reason is they probably live and die with their lymph nodes and it's not detected by us. Here's a slide that was given to me by Ernie Mazzaferi, and just in his honor, I've included it in this talk, just to show you the capriciousness of the anatomy of distribution of lymph nodes. The anatomy of distribution is very unpredictable many times. It doesn't follow a echelon-related stepwise uh, um, uh, metastatic uh, uh, level rate. And um, many times you'll see lymph nodes in level two having skipped various levels. What is the impact of, no of nodal metastases on prognosis? Well, in our series, we looked at it, and really it didn't have much of an impact on outcome as long as you did something about it. Uh, here's a slide I lifted from Jay Shaw with his permission. And in fact, their series shows the same. However, if you tease out the, um, the lymph node metastatic survival in terms of age, older people tend to do worse in terms of survival than youngsters. And this has been shown in many series. Again, a series from the, the um, uh, Blake Cady's group showing that the prognosis in terms of survival is worse in elderly patients. So we looked at 110 recurrences, which uh, represented about 21% uh, of lymph node extant lymph node disease, and the central compartment was by far the commonest site of recurrence. And central compartment disease does better than the other compartments. And if you look at it in terms of central compartment and all the other compartments, again, the central compartment does better. So it stands to reason, uh, intuitively, maybe we should look at the central compartment a little bit more uh, deta in detail to determine whether we can eliminate this type of situation. What about recurrent, well-differentiated thyroid cancer? What impact does it have on survival? Well, we looked at several groups, no recurrence, one recurrence, multiple recurrences. In terms of survival, obviously recurrences impact on survival, and more so, recurrences impact on subsequent recurrences. That is to say, uh, the old saying, recurrences beget recurrences. And what are the factors that predispose to recurrences? Well, this has been studied up, down, and sideways. Age, stage of disease, vascular invasion, uh, distant METs, uh, MESA's score, and time of recurrence. So what, how should we look at neck dissection in terms of, uh, central neck dissection in terms of uh, indication thereof? And I think it's, it's axiomatic to say that if you see or feel or have imaging evidence of nodes, those nodes should be dissected. The problem is, who deserves a prophylactic, prophylactic central neck dissection? Well, why should we do a prophylactic neck dissection first? A high incidence of occult nodes and PTC, maybe that's an indication. Certainly, uh, we're all agreed that a central node dissection should be part of the strategy for dealing with medullary thyroid cancer. Since central METs have negative impact on outcome, it would be better to dissect them prophylactically. Well, maybe that's true. A safe procedure in, in experienced hands, we've got series after series attesting to the safety. Reoperation carries increased morbidity, so it's better to do it up front, makes sense. Some studies, albeit all of them pretty flawed, suggest that disease clearance is more comprehensive with prophylactic dissection, and some flawed series suggest that better outcomes uh, occur with prophylactic dissection in terms of survival and recurrence. However, the caveat is always there is no compelling evidence for outcome advantage. I have not seen a series that convinces me thereof. So at the end of the day, who gets central neck dissection other than those surgeons who do prophylactic for all cancers? Well, many surgeons do it for advanced T-stage, for aggressive histological types, 
and for gross extrathyroidal extension. I think the jury's still out on the intermediate and high risk patient because data is still lacking. So that's seven minutes. Um, let me just go through um, the options for recurrent disease, observation, radiofrequency ablation, alcohol ablation, and reoperation in the central compartment. All of these are, are options. The ATA guidelines suggest that we shouldn't look at disease greater than eight, eight millimeters in the central compartment. And if we follow Ito's paradigm for dealing with microscopic disease, perhaps there's a place for observation in those patients with known metastatic disease that's sub subcentimeric. Radiofrequency ablation is proposed by the Italian groups. And clearly, there is a cost-effective uh, advantage to do alcohol ablation in patients with um, uh, minimal central disease with alcohol ablation. The disadvantage, of course, is that what is the surgical field like in those that have failed? And um, Clive Grant tells me it's not a great place to operate on uh, in the secondary situation. And of course, Mike Tuttle's group has shown that many of these patients can be followed without surgery according to Ito's paradigm. So I'm just going to skip over these slides and just go to my video. Uh, we do nerve monitoring. Let me just spend one second telling you that we do nerve monitoring in the redo situation, not to identify the nerve, but to tell us if in fact it's safe to go to the other side in a heretofore negative other side uh, if that nerve stimulates on the ipsilateral side. Okay, could I have my video, please? So this is a seven-minute video on a redo central compartment dissection. And of course, we can extrapolate to the primary central compartment dissection uh, in, the, in the virgin case. So this is... Uh, a map of the central compartment that you've seen before. We go from the cricoid to the anominate. This is a 21-year-old patient with a recurrence in the left paratracheal area. There's an image of that. Classical stippled calcification um, appearance on the uh, cross-sectional image. So here we are, I like to excise the scar. I was castigated once because we do our nerve monitor in the chest. Uh, I've never had a problem with keloids or hypertrophic scars. We remove the scar, we elevate our flaps. Um, we split, divide the strap muscles in the midline or split the strap muscles in the midline to ascertain our level. I try to go up as high as I can, optimally to the thyroid notch, but not necessarily. Because this is high stake surgery, uh, we don't do this in the primary case, but in the secondary case, I divide all the straps laterally in order to gain exposure. Here we are dividing the long straps. And then after that, the sternothyroid short strap. And if you're doing one side, obviously just divide it on one side, both sides, divide it on both sides. The one constant piece of anatomy in the redo situation is the carotid artery, and we'll address that in a second. What I do is I um, elevate the straps superiorly and inferiorly to fully expose the central compartment. Here we have our inferior um, elevation of straps. The carotid artery doesn't move very much. The recurrent nerve does, and all adjacent structures do, including the parathyroids. So the, par the, the common carotid artery is dissected throughout its whole uh, common length, and the right side is dissected to the level of the anominate. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve is found in its, we try to find it in the usual position. 
Um, the head is up here, the feet are down there. And I try to go to an area where dissection has been minimal. I, I use a blunt dissecting peanut, and here's the recurrent nerve found. Then we then trace it through its length. Once we've done that, we trace it right up to the level of its insertion into the posterior aspect of the cricothyroid joint. I like to use a pinch burn technique with bipolar cautery. It's precise and it does minimal damage. Once we've identified both common carotids, we then look for our parathyroids. And um, here, here's the common carotid. Here's the parathyroid on its vascular access. What I try to do is preserve thymic tissue to preserve the blood supply. So the parathyroid is here. And then once it's on its vascular supply, we just um, insert it under the right angle retractor. So here's the anominate. Here's the common carotid. Recurrent nerve is up here. We do this on both sides, if necessary. And then the opposite parathyroid, this is the left parathyroid, feet are down here, head is up here, and we do a similar dissection on this side. Again, dissecting it on its thymic horn in order to uh, preserve the blood supply. And we'll do basically the same thing on the, for the upper parathyroids. You saw the left recurrent nerve. So once we've got all our ducts in place, that is all our anatomy exposed, we can then remove the necessary central compartment disease and know that our anatomy is intact and preserved. So here we are on the left side, the recurrent nerve is here, we're dissecting the central compartment using the pinch burn technique and I commend this to your use because again it's precise and does minimal damage. Once we've elevated it off the recurrent nerve, we then dissect <laughs> it free of the trachea and use our unipolar cautery to do so once we're at a distance from the uh, neural structures. Sometimes there are paratracheal nodes on the lateral aspect of the recurrent nerve. And in this particular case, there, were one on, there was one on each side. In the olden days, I used to try to keep the specimen in continuity and elevate the nerve and dissect it under. I don't think that's necessary. I just do a lateral paratracheal dissection um, in order to minimize trauma to the recurrent nerve. And here we are taking out that metastatic node here, and we do the same thing on the opposite side. Here's the recurrent nerve. So here's our final anatomy. Here's our two parathyroids on the um, vascular axis and thymus. Head is up here, feet are down there. Here is a left lateral view. Here's the <coughs> left recurrent laryngeal nerve with, with its esophageal uh, filaments and branches. Here's the upper parathyroid preserved, common carotid artery. <coughs> Here's the right lateral view with the right parathyroid on its vascular <coughs> axis, recurrent nerve, common carotid. We're testing the nerve for its integrity. You can <coughs> see the esophagus twitching when we do that. We like to close our wounds with um, absorbable subcuticular suture after closing <coughs> the strap muscles, obviously. Here we go. <coughs> and here's our pathology specimen laid out. So here are the two paratracheal nodes and here's our central compartment. I just have two more slides to go through. If I can go back to the slides, please. So here is the stepwise menu of uh, maneuvers for the central compartment dissection. Strap muscles, common carotids, recurrent nerve, parathyroids, central compartment, paratracheal nodes and closure. We've done 204 of these operations to date. 
1.5% vocal cord injury, 7% hypoparathyroid. I can't get lower than that in these redo cases, and normalization of TG in 55% of cases. So the take-home message is papillary thyroid cancer is detected with increasing frequency. Metastatic node involvement is common, although the influence on outcome is debatable, except in the patient over 45 years. Incidence of subsequent nodal metastases increases with the discovery of metastatic nodes at initial surgery. Detection of metastatic nodes is being affected with increasing accuracy and increasing incidence. Commonest site of recurrent disease is the central compartment. Management of metastatic nodes is controversial, yes. Several modalities are available to manage metastatic nodes, but observation is a viable option in selected patients. And technical stepwise approach to central and upper mediastinal um, oper operation has been shown. Thank you very much. <laughs>